author William Saroyan said that art is looking at things carefully. And when I first read that, I just thought, okay, so that means that the artist is looking at things carefully. But then I thought a little bit more about it and I thought, well, if we look at things carefully, maybe that is a participation in the art itself or we are the artists. So anyway, in that spirit, I wanna take a deep dive into two choruses of the blues played by the great Percy Heath. Let's do it. Welcome to Learn Jazz Bass with Matt Rubicki. And as always, you know what to do. Look for that PDF below, like, subscribe, the whole nine yards. Today we are talking about the great Percy Heath. There's a lot of sort of royalty in his sound and in his choices and in his delivery of the music. So this tune is called Walkin' off of the Miles Davis album, Walkin', which is actually a compilation of previous, previously released singles that had come before with a couple different um, ensembles. So Percy Heath is playing bass, Horace Silver on piano, and Kenny Clark is playing drums. Now this, uh, transcription that I have is the first two choruses of the very first solo, which is Miles' solo, and it's coming out of a break. And for those that may not sort of be familiar with the word break, although you've heard it many times, it's just a suspension of the rhythm and leaving empty space for the soloist to lead in. If there's one thing that I'd love for you to take from this little video today, it's the use of this little device in bar one that Percy Heath does. So Miles is playing through the break leading into the beginning of his solo. Uh, Kenny Clark is playing this press roll building tension into the very first uh, bar of the form. And what Percy does is he does not play on beat one, but you see it's on the end of one. And what is so neat about this is that he is contributing to that sense of the tension and release. He's releasing in this really great way. It's sort of like a slingshot. Um, the, the, the time has started, but there's just this slight delay and it just sort of pops off. And that gives this sense of, whoa, you know, something's happening. So what it sounds like is one, two, three, four, one. One, two, three, four, one, and two. That little thing of just that little pause, that little unexpected syncopation is going to really help sort of um, galvanize the whole ensemble when they hear that. As small as it is, it can make a really, really big impact. So you'll notice also in bar two now, he is implying um, a, a, a progression from B flat seven to be diminished going back to F. And essentially it would be sort of F7 over C in the bass. So the whole of bar two is sort of like going B flat and then B natural. And then he gets to the C, which is the fifth of F7 in bar three. So even though there's extra notes in there, bar two is, it's really all that. And so he's sort of ornamenting that movement and playing the fifth on the downbeat of beat three, as I said. And you notice in these choruses that happens several times, not only on the F7, but uh, in some of the other chords, he is starting the bar with a fifth, which is totally uh, legal, <laughs> so to speak. And it occurred to me while I was listening to this that that kind of approach where we are staying you know relatively open as to whether we play the downbeats i'm sorry whether we play the roots on the downbeats sort of allows for a generally more almost mysterious or open sound it's sort of like things can go anywhere it really sort of lets um, a sense of breathing happen harmonically because what what you're doing by playing the fifth is playing a very very strong note but it's not quite what's expected and so on. So it just leaves it a little bit open, which I think allows for a little more um, expression, so to speak. In bar three, you'll notice that he ends this bar with the sixth. So five, root, three, six. And then that's the fifth of F again in bar four. What the point I wanna bring up here is that Nowhere in these choruses does he actually define the F7 with that flat seven, the E flat. There's no E flats in here at all, which is kind of interesting because it doesn't take away at all from the sound of the blues, does it? And I think this is something we can apply to our own playing as well. Like 
yes, these core tones are really important and help to define that sound, but if that's taken care of by the pianist or the soloist or both, it allows us to play again a little more sort of obtusely. <laughs> and we don't have to clearly define every single thing as long as it's done clearly and with intention. So you'll notice in bar five and six, we've got, generally speaking, a B flat seven when we play a blues. This is the four dominant chord. Um, and what he is doing here is again, not playing a chord tone on the downbeat of measure six, uh, but rather continuing an idea that he started previously in bar five. So bar five is one, five, one again, and then flat seven, the A flat. Now he's got the chord, the sound the color is B flat seven again, but he's just gonna continue what he's doing from the, the sound, the color of the chord, because the chord is continuing. So it's G on the B flat, that is the sixth of B flat, and then he goes down to the fifth and then the root. So quickly getting out of that non chord tone downbeat into chord tones really allows the ear to quickly resolve. Like it's very clear what he's doing and it sounds totally normal and very good. And then he leads again with that B natural, that chromatic passing tone to the fifth of F7, C natural on measure seven, seven, yes, measure seven. So bars seven and eight are also uh, simple and cool at the same time. Uh, bar seven, three, I'm sorry, five, three, five, one. And now in bar eight, in beats three and four, I think he is implying a D seven, the fifth of the G minor seven that's coming. So the five seven of the two minor, two minor is G minor seven. So he plays, uh, in that bar, A, which is the third of F, F, root, and then this D is the sixth of F, but I think that by putting it on the, on the, the, um, the third beat and the F sharp is next, leading to G, so that very clearly to me sounds like he is intending to have that be the five of G minor seven. Measure nine and 10, Again, pretty cool. I like measure nine in that it does something unexpected and not something that I personally do very often. So I'm like, I like hearing <laughs> new ways of approaching it. Yeah. He plays root on the downbeat G flat three, very normal, and then descends chromatically. So sort of a very familiar sound to us, but in this context, it's a little bit like unusual for me at least. So root flat three a is the nine or the second degree and then a chromatic passing tone a flat to g which is the fifth of c7 so and now he's on c7 again playing the fifth on the downbeat measure 11 i think again he is probably thinking f7 d7 going to um uh what would be a two five there leading back to the beginning of the form, but he doesn't play F sharp, so I'm not entirely sure. What is pretty clear, I think, is that he found himself in a place where he needed to just discard the G minor seven and instead implies C seven for the whole bar. So um, measure uh, 11 is D, B natural, and then that B natural is leading to C, which, is the root of C7, the fifth of the whole uh, key center. And also this is the end of the first chorus. And so this is a strong pull back to the beginning of the next chorus and back to that tonic sound. So I think he's just doing away with G minor seven and playing C7 instead. He plays root, fifth, fifth, root. It's pretty obvious what's happening there. He's trying to go back to the F major, which makes a lot of sense and is such a strong sound. So measure 13 is a pretty standard way of approaching this kind of sound, this kind of dominant chord in a blues, uh, root three, five, uh, a, a descending chromatic passing note leading to B flat in the next bar. What I like about this next bar, so this is technically bar 14 or the second bar of the second chorus, is that he's playing root, flat seven, there's the six, and he knows that the next chord that's coming again is F7. So he could theoretically play G flat here. So it could be, it could be that, 
but I think this is more elegant what he does. He plays B flat, A flat, G, E natural, so a chromatic from below. It just has a sort of a more, I don't know, distinctive sound somehow, and, and I, I just think it sounded cooler in that context than that's fine, but it just sounds stronger to me. So in measure 15, he does the old standard walk up. Everybody's favorite, you know, everybody can use it. You should use it, put it in your own line, put it in every key, as we've said before. So he does that in measure 15. Measure 17 is kind of neat because um, he, there's a juxtaposition there of what is happening with the piano and what Miles is playing. The notes they are playing are a little bit of a um, little dissonant. They're implying sort of alternate harmony, what would be there. And rather than go with that, Percy plays like this very, very simple, rooted, grounded one, three, six, five, you know, like the most standard thing, but he does it with this attitude, which sort of matches that thumbing the nose at the harmony that the piano and Miles are doing that Horace and Miles are doing. So he plays. So it, it, that G is very aggressive there. And it also feels really good. And then beat four is A natural on a B flat seven. So, you know, that, that's another case where a passing tone sort of out of nowhere doesn't really conflict with the harmony because it's leading so strongly to the root in the next measure. The root is B flat there. So uh, that's still B flat there. So that makes total sense. In measure 19 here, which is the um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, se seventh measure of the blues form, uh, what would be F7? He's playing uh, F7, but again, he plays the fifth on the downbeat. So C, we've heard that before in this chorus. And then here he is again implying now, I think a whole measure of D7 going to G minor seven. It could be that he was also thinking A minor seven, D seven. So what would be a two five going to G minor seven because he starts the bar with A, but B two is a D again. So it's really kind of like five, one, one, three, or I've analyzed it as if it were the A minor. So one, four, one, three, one would be the A and then D natural. That would be the four of A minor seven, but root third, F, F sharp out of the key, but a strong sound going to G minor. Uh, and you'll notice that he plays um, a continuing descending line from this point forward. So he plays G. That's a neat sound that I think is very effective because as we've mentioned before, using that open G or using any open string to get up the neck allows for time and a little more accuracy. And this D here, this is beat three of measure 22. So this is a D natural on C7. It, again, the sort of breaks rules. Like we shouldn't often, we're told at the beginning, like don't play a non-chord tone on a strong beat. Beats one and three are strong beats. Don't play a non-chord tone. This totally makes sense. One, just a chromatic walk up there, totally makes sense. And um, uh, escaping sort of from it to this open G and then E. So up. It's almost as if he, he, the sound continues up, but it doesn't like that's kind of the sound that is implied, right? but it, instead he plays the same sort of idea, but it's just adds this little bit of sort of unexpected surprise, which is always great. Measure 24, which is the last bar of the second course is kind of the only one I don't totally understand what he was doing there. It, the, the chord would be either G minor seven, C seven or C seven, the five going back to one. And he plays C root and then C sharp, which is fine. But then he jumps to G, which is a little weird. So it feels like he sort of was changing directions in the moment. It, 
It's not a bad sound at all. I just don't sort of understand it analytically, but that's fine. We, we don't absolutely have to analyze every single thing. And I have a habit of overdoing that as you probably know already. Um, sometimes it just sounds good and that's why we should do it. So uh, check out the way that this works together with the solo. Actually go listen to the recording and notice the choices that he's making in context with what the other players are doing. I hope this was helpful as always. Thanks for joining me for this short video. Like, subscribe, look for the PDF. Remember, straight ahead and strive for tone.